Welcome to chapel today. This is a real special chapel. I'm here with a, uh, a friend. And so before we get talking, I want to give a little bit of an introduction that will frame a few things for us, and then we'll start having some good Q&A here. So it is my privilege yeah. to introduce to you uh, Mrs. Catherine Wolf. Some of you probably know Catherine and have heard of her ministry and testimony and her husband, Jay. But let me give an introduction. Catherine is originally from the South, where she met her husband, married and moved to Los Angeles to pursue the entertainment industry. She's going to talk about that here in just a minute. Her son, James, was born in 2007. And just six months later, after the birth of James, Catherine miraculously survived a catastrophic stroke caused by a congenital brain defect that she never knew that she had. After a 16-hour brain surgery, 40 days in ICU, a year in neuro rehab, 11 operations, she continues her journey of recovery to this day. In 2015, Catherine gave birth to their miracle baby, John, their John Bomb. I'm reading this correctly. That's okay. right. Who has blown up their lives in every way. Since 2008, Catherine and her husband Jay have been disrupting the myth, listen closely to this, that joy can only be found in a pain-free life through speaking events, best-selling books, a thriving online community, and the Hope Heals Camp for families affected by disability. Today, she lives in Atlanta with her husband and two boys. Would you please join me in welcoming Catherine Wolf today? Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Well, it is an honor to have you on campus. Oh, as it's a blessing to be here. Thank you for having me. It is our privilege, and you and I were talking before and backstage. Um, we have lots of common friends, yes. and so we've just never had the privilege of having you or you and Jay. I know many times you are together for as sure. a couple. That's right. And so it is a privilege to have you here. So we're just going to jump you. right in, yeah. okay, because I know you've got a lot of things on your heart. And so let's just start with this one. Can you take a few minutes sure. and just share with us how you and Jay met, fell in love, and what your dreams were going forward as you started life together? So start us kind of from the beginning of the two of you together and your walk together. Absolutely. My husband, Jay, and I met in Birmingham, Alabama at a small Baptist college called Sanford University. And we met when we were 18 and married when we were 22. We were children. And um, yeah, it was crazy and fun. And we moved from, I'm from Georgia, he's from Alabama. And we promptly married and moved to California, kind of for this crazy adventure when we were young and stupid. And um, loved Jesus, wanted to honor him with our lives, but had no idea what that would look like. And he was attending Pepperdine University in the law program. And I was doing a number of things to pay the bills and having a blast. I was uh, modeling catalogs, so it's not like modeling, it's like, you know, Target ads where I'm holding the, you know, diaper canister and, um, you know, Disney Tiki Hut modeling for their 20th anniversary Tiki Hut Moo Moo and other fascinating things to pay our bills. And we were having a blast and we, um, yeah, we're just kind of having this young, fun adventure and um, knew that Jesus had something for our lives, probably like many of you feel. You don't know what it is yet. I definitely didn't as a 22-year-old. I don't know how y'all, old y'all are. But knew that um, the Lord was preparing us for a life that we did not know at the time we would live. Um, but we had a deep foundation that could withstand some significant storms. And at our wedding, 
my father-in-law, who is a pastor, performed the ceremony. And during the message, he referenced um, the passage in Matthew, Matthew 7, I think, about the storms in life and needing to be founded on the rock. And that's not exactly a message you hear at many weddings. You hear... Yeah, let's talk about storms at the right, wedding, right? Exactly. It's going to be You're really here. bad. You're here in 1 Corinthians 13 in the love chapter, and instead, my father-in-law is sharing there will be storms, they are coming to you, get ready, and he would had no, had no idea that you know, under that wedding veil was a massive birth defect that would render me disabled extremely and just rock our whole lives only three years later. So um, pretty dramatic, the importance of founding your life on um, Jesus. It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, for those of us that are married in the room, um, not to one another, but just married, um, it's interesting, you know, wow, you stand at the altar and you don't know what lies ahead, do you? No, you don't. In fact, you know, they say you end up marrying a stranger in many ways, yeah. but can you learn to love yeah. the person that you've committed your life to as they change throughout many iterations in your life? So true. So true. Well, hey, I want to jump into um, your specific story. Yeah. So you woke up that particular morning like it was any other day. I just had a baby six months before. Okay. Exactly. So, it was so per James, perfectly healthy. So James is, what, six, seven months old? Is that right? James was six okay. months, five days old. Yep. And Jay had just graduated. So Jay, her husband, had just graduated from law school. He was just so, about to. It was April. He would graduate the month after. Okay. So think of where they are in their season and their walk. Right. You got your whole life ahead of you. Right. I mean, you're, you know, modeling diapers, apparently, you yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> you're doing all that kind of exactly stuff. Exactly something. Right? Yeah. Future looked promising. That's what I'm trying to say. Absolutely. You're right. And then something happened on April 21, 2008. You're exactly. It was a completely normal morning. And I felt weird, but I'd felt weird since having a baby six months before. You I mean you slept. felt weird that morning? Something physically felt different? Well, Is I, that what you I mean? I was a little dizzy and had okay. a headache. And, you know, I rationalized like, oh, this is so normal that something's a little off. It's not a big deal. And then as the day progressed, it, you know, climaxed in me throwing up, um, becoming so dizzy that I couldn't stand anymore, and essentially ending the day with the AVM that was in my brain that I never knew I had because I was perfectly healthy my entire life with no medical history, no family history, no health problems whatsoever. But this birth defect had ruptured into my brain stem, and the pressure was herniating it down into the brain stem, which is unsurvivable. The doctors do not know why I lived, in fact, but basically in the process of this AV and this birth defect rupturing and then the subsequent stroke, the doctor game time decision over 16 hours made the call to remove so much of what you see today uh, that doesn't work on my body. He made the decision to remove 60% of my cerebellum, which is the reason I can't walk. It's my the ability to balance in your brain, the cerebellum. And that's why this hand doesn't work. And that he, he made the decision to cut the cranial nerve that, that controls the face and the auditory nerve I'm deaf in this ear. And if I may tell some something really cool about that to you seminary students. There is such, to me, a powerful um, connect to the wise and careful surgeon making the decision to make sacrifices in order for me to live. And I feel like that is such an incredibly beautiful biblical concept. It says in Job that he wounds and he heals. That in the sacrificing, there can be flourishing. And that is really the gospel story. So I think it's a, a fascinating word picture of 
tremendous brokenness due to sacrifices that in fact enabled me to sustain life. I've heard uh, you and Jay tell this story before, and I know you've got a lot of it in the books. We'll talk about this here in just a minute, yeah. as you guys have uh, ministered to many. Um, you know, it's supposed to be even in that dialogue of um, the doctor talking to, to Jay saying, she's not going to make it. Right. I mean, it was pretty clear of saying, yes. here's what we're going to do. We're going to make decisions along the way. And I can remember him describing that moment. I know you've heard him say it many times. You oh, weren't yeah. there with him in the waiting room. But as he's hearing this, this news for the right. first time and individuals from your church, do you have any comments that you would make? I remember him saying, um, as he was there and as you are wheeled off and the doctor has already given the news saying, hey, she's probably not going to make it. Right, in fact, yes. I'm not even sure whether we should do the surgery. And right. he said, if we do this, it's going to take six to eight hours, 16 hours later. And I right. remember the testimony of the doctor being able to say he didn't even look at his watch. He just felt the Lord just moving him and leading him to keep doing what he needed to do and make all of those decisions. Yes, yes. But I heard Jay say, and this was fascinating. Tell me if you want to unpack this. Any, sure. Of It was for the first time ever that he felt the church or felt like he was really belonging to the church. Clear relationship with the Lord. Right. But there was a community right. in y'all's local Isn't church it that just, yeah, what, do you, what thoughts that would you have on that? They say that in neurobiological world realms that something about a community really embracing you changes how you feel about what you're experiencing. It's just so biblical that somehow this community, and Jay had grown up, he's a pastor's son in Alabama. He grew up a church, but he describes it as he had never felt held by church and belong, belonging to a belovedness until his wife nearly died. That something about the way those people showed up, didn't leave and really stayed is the gift we get to give each other as the body of Christ. It's not, I'm believing Jesus and it's my walk with the Lord, but no, it's our walk with the Lord and we are believing Jesus and we need to hold your hands up because you don't, you don't have the words. And he got to experience that. He says the holiest moment, the most church he's ever had is probably what you're referencing was in the waiting room when his wife was dying. Was That was what church should look like. And I like to make an aside that um, American churches or Western world churches need to look more like that all the time that we should be about disrupting the deep lie that joy is only found when things are perfect, when there's pain-free living. No, the church needs to get in there when things are not okay and be there, stay there. It's interesting. I didn't tell you this. We just didn't have enough time to talk about it. But one of the themes that's been going on, it seems, uh, this spring semester for us, those of you that have been participating in uh, chapel. Uh, we, we have what's called every spring semester at the beginning and the second week, we have what's called a spiritual life week. Yeah. And part of that is to simply draw our hearts closer to the Lord. And uh, we had one of our retired professors by the name of Jim Allman that was with us all week long and delivered some powerful messages about how the Lord uses suffering. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's not something that you think of as, you know, what's your topic going to be for rallying the spiritual life? Well, we're going to talk about pain and suffering. Right. Everybody come to chapel. Right. You know? And uh, the Lord did something very special in that regard of going after our hearts because... A hundred percent. The Lord frequently uses... Um, Pain is, is one of God's great tutors, isn't it? Oh my gosh, yes. The yeah. things we learn in the darkness. It says, Isaiah 45, 3, that the Lord gives hidden treasure in the darkness, riches stored in secret places, so that we may know him, the God of Israel, the God who summoned us by name. This amazing thought that when you're forced into the deep, terrible darkness, that God has something there for us, some treasure that we get to then carry with us through life and champion. And that it's, it's coming anyway, whether we recognize it or not. John 16, 33 is true. You probably know it. That in this world, there will be suffering. There will be terrible pain. 
but that we can take heart because of the reality that suffering, if we allow it, can inform the way we live the rest of our lives and change how we experience earth. I want to get there, but let's back up in that story. Yeah, a yeah, bit. totally. Okay. Sorry, no, we jumped you're good. ahead. You're good. Um, so uh, your eyes opened many days later after right. this miraculous surgery. And I, it's a great story. If you've not heard the details of it, um, you can get it in, in the book. Um, you can Google online and hear other messages. It's, it's cool. It's, I it's agree. powerful in regard to um, opening her eyes. And so can, connect us there. You opened your eyes after these many, many days and days of sedation. For and, sure. And I want to talk about from that moment for about five years, yeah. you're, you're doing a lot of wrestling. In, in one sense, I could say, you know, let's, you have suffered physically, but yeah. there, this, this rehab process was more than just physical. Right. Is that fair? Oh, my God. Okay, so start with it. Isn't the ultimate battle always up here? Yes, amen. And here. So you opened your eyes. Run us forward for about four or five years after that. Yeah, so I wake up about two and a half months after the stroke. And, of course, how can you even process? My life's been turned completely upside down. I'm hooked up to machines all over my body. I have a big feeding tube where they're feeding me through in my stomach. I've got a trach. I mean, I just can't fathom what's happened. And it was horrific on every level. But by far, the very worst pain was that my sweet, now almost nine-month-old, is being brought into the room to visit mom. And I can't process that this is my baby, so now this is the day he will stay with me in the hospital because he's my baby. I take care of him now. And that would be months before I could understand that I, I couldn't care for him. And, you know, I see James, a little baby, being brought in by friends and family, and it's like Groundhog Day every day for me early on. So every day I'm thinking, today's the day I will modestly feed my baby in the hospital bed and take care of him here. And it was as if I couldn't process that I couldn't do it. It was just like, I'll, I'll do that. That deep maternal instinct was, he's my child and I've got to care for him. And... I think we have a picture of my first Mother's Day. Do we, Caroline? Do you see Mother's Day? That's the first, um, that's still when I was in ICU. And I have such a a love-hate relationship with that picture because I have no memory of that day. And that is, um, whew. That is very painful. For those of you yeah. that are mothers, I can, I can only imagine oh, what, what that was like and what you're describing Excruciating. Here. Yeah. And I love that photo because I don't have those memories. Um, but it's really sad. And I always like to say, um, in any Christian context, and to you future Christian leaders in America, I think that being sad and having sorrow is not mutually exclusive from having joy in life, that there can be low-grade sorrow in stories. There can be pain that is not resolved until heaven. And I don't think that is, um, like, to be a Christian means everything is just fine now. I got over that. I moved on. No, I think we can move forward in life, but we carry with us scars and I'm not going to forget that I didn't get to take care of my baby. He's not going to forget that his wife died. She's not going to forget that her sister died. But we can carry these things well through life and give God glory even in the midst of still hurting and sadness. And that's my story. I know you frequently use uh, the words of a Crowder song. I do. I love that you're tracking. Yes. You like I, that? I'm a stalker. You didn't know that, but uh, sorry no, about that. Well, I'm yeah. sitting here like, this dude knows a lot of detail. 
Well, I actually watched you this morning while I was working out, so it's fresh uh, in my mind. No, yeah, that's no right. wonder. Yes, yeah. I, I love to say I'll share it. So if you guys know David Crowder, he's an amazing musician, and he goes to my church in Atlanta, and he sings this song, and the lyrics say, Earth has no sorrow that heaven won't heal. So I say a lot that Earth has no sorrow that heaven won't heal. But we're not in heaven, and there is still sorrow. And why can sorrow not coexist with many of the amazing gifts of God that we experience in this lifetime? But where does it say all sorrow is gone? That there's no more pain here? We're not in heaven yet. There is pain, the side of heaven, and all is not well. One day it will be. I love that you brought that up. I do. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> Can you talk about, um, you had a big team that rallied around you during those uh, early years, Totally. Right? And I mean, obviously, uh, Jay's not here with us today, but can you talk about how his life was dumped upside down? I mean, you know, we're, we're all making this journey with you, and for those that are meeting you here for the first time, hearing your, your story yeah. of, you know, we, we think of marriage and hope and excitement and enthusiasm and for better or for worse. Right. And, and no life, one wants the worst. And not knowing what's coming. And so you had a big team that rallied around you, but can you talk a little bit of, you know, how his life was dumped upside down? Oh, my goodness. Well, as any of you married people in the room know, when it's happening to your spouse, it's happening to you. You're not separate people anymore. Jay says, I might as well have had the stroke as well. Like, he's lived every moment of this, and now he's my full-time caretaker and my chauffeur. I don't drive, and my personal stylist. Don't I look cute? <laughs> and he's had to take on everything, and that's how it is. And, and I'm not just the recipient of all of the incredible stuff Jay Wolf is. He is. But he's getting some incredible stuff from me because I'm loving all the hard parts of his life, all the things that are not perfect in his story. This is some outside junk for sure. But we've all got inside junk from where we've been, what we've been through, the sin that has wrecked and ravaged our lives, painful memories. I call them invisible wheelchairs. Some of us have them very clearly on the outside, but we've all got them on the inside. We've all got hard stuff in our stories, and marriage is about navigating those with each other for our whole lives, and, and Jay's done it exceptionally well. Others have come around you as well. Yes. What can you say about not just your church family, which is a beautiful testimony to the body of Christ. Absolutely. Oh, gosh, yes. But, but family and friends and everybody in that community, what did you learn along the way as you um, had other people step in and serve and join your family in one sense in a way that they had never done before? Absolutely. What well, can you make observations on what you learned along the way watching that kind of service that partnered with you it, all? It, it has been overwhelming through the years. I mean, the, we've been the recipients of just tremendous, um, just a deep, it's way beyond kindness, just a deep showing up in people's pain story. And we long to do that with our lives in a way I never understood before, that I can really step into the story and not leave when it gets hard and awkward and sad and is ongoing and say, I'm not leaving. It's really terrible right now where you are, but I'm here. And that's what people have done over and over in our story. And the reality is the hope of Jesus that we get to give each other is a transformative reality for every story that we get to say I'm not leaving Jesus isn't either we are in this we are with you and it's hard and I'm not backing out the back door I'm in this and I'm, I'm here for the long haul and that's what people have done for us and now especially through our Hope Hills community and camp community we long to do that for other people and say it's very sad and it may not be okay this side of heaven, 
We deal with medically fragile people mostly who are not getting well, that there's no cure, and yet can we say, we're staying with you. And we found the very most healing thing that anyone said to us after my stroke was, I cannot believe this happened to you. I am just so sorry. It's shocking. And like, I probably had 10,000 people say random things to me, both wonderful and bizarre, about, you know, the, my life, my, the stroke. And there's something so healing and just saying, this is awful and it's shocking and I'm not going anywhere. And it, it changes how safe you feel in the story. Because I think so much of our, our fear is connected to we don't feel safe in the story we're in. And what if we do? What if we end up loving the story we're in? What if we flip it and say, actually, I get to redefine how I feel about the story that God is writing in my life. And I believe somehow this is a very, very good story. And I mean good, not as the world has wrongly defined good. We'll probably get to that in a minute. I'm jumping ahead, but I think we've all defined good very wrong. So I keep going? No, you're, yeah, you're on a roll, so we've got you here. This will kind of lead you maybe a little bit. Um, you are a person of great joy. Yes. As is Jay. Right, yes. As I have watched and listened and... It's part of your messaging, and I really mean that. Can you talk to us about having joy, and you've already been doing that, right. uh, in the midst of trials and in the midst of the storm? Because I'm hearing you talk about this, this reframing process. So, so important, I think, as Christians. Um, you know, I, I've dealt with a lot of insecurity because I don't want my joy to interfere or make someone feel like, wait, I don't have that joy as I experience this trial, what's wrong with me? But the reality is I'm choosing joy. It's not like I just, I'm just joyful. No, I'm intentionally changing my brain every day, creating new neuro pathways to experience joy in a story where there could be no joy, but I'm recognizing that joy is not mutually exclusive from hard things. That there can be joy in the story where there is pain and suffering and sorrow. And will you all share the picture from my 40th birthday party? I might as well talk about it here because this is a good example. So this is my 40th birthday party. I turned 40 this year. And if you were to look at that picture and you're like, that girl turned 40 and she can't even stand up for her 40th birthday party, it might be kind of a sad photo. Like, well, that's kind of sad. She's seated. Like, maybe you, you could tell I'm disabled. Like, sad. And then separately, if you were to look at that picture, and you were to identify a few more key details, like in that picture is a husband who stayed when their life flew up at 26. There is a miracle seven-year-old baby in that picture who was never supposed to be. That is a functioning, joyful family who's moving forward in life. There is a woman who nearly died of a unsurvivable, massive brainstem stroke. Like, suddenly, you feel a little differently about the picture, right? So what you've done is you've redefined how you see something. And I think that is what we are called to do as Christians, is redefine absolutely everything. I believe you can survive anything by redefining everything in your story that, wait, I get to think about that differently. Like, and we may fall very different places. We may land theologically different on this issue or that issue. But I get to look in and with the lens that I have, which is the gospel lens, redefine how I feel about that. Like, for me, what if I love my life? What if I just decide I love this story? I trust God enough that somehow this is a good story he's writing. Like, what if I did that? What if I wasn't like, this is something to be overcome? No, what if I'm like, I get to live well in this chair my whole life? 
What if I get to champion this story that God's writing? I think we might live in a different world, even as Christians, if we were able to really start doing that and saying, no, 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 I'm not trying to get out of the wheelchair. I'm trying to recognize the freedom from this, that this is actually freeing me to live my life and live it joyfully. Okay. One of the things that you guys have done with this joy um, you have uh, found hope. You've started a ministry. Would you kind of explain to us um, this morning your vision for this nonprofit and what it means to you and Jay? Because I know God is doing great things through it. Oh, uh, you're really sweet. Yes. Um, about 10, almost exactly 10 years ago, we had been speaking and writing, and one thing just kind of led to another that we recognized that the population of people living with disabilities on the outside of their body is really just an underserved population across the board in every category. And as future Christian leaders, you must know that the population living with physical disabilities is the least churched population both in the United States and worldwide right now. They say that 20% of people are living with a disability, a physical disability, and they are on every single list you would never want to be on, from homelessness, divorce, suicide, the rates are the highest among the population living with disabilities. So my husband and I just kind of came to, what can we do here? You know, it's no accident we're here. What so can what you do can, with this part of the story? Right, right, exactly. And so we ended up kind of through research finding that the deepest need that persons living with disabilities have is relationships, rest, and resourcing of all kinds. So we founded first this camp where we brought a whole family for free to a summer camp experience and resourced them deeply in all ways, provided relationships, deep rest. And that has kind of, I mean, that still exists. Please come, volunteer if you can, we need you. But now it's morphed into retreats and local experiences. And most recently, we have felt this just deep call to provide employment for people with disabilities. So we're opening a coffee shop in Atlanta that will employ people with special needs and give a, just a place for people to hang out and form relationships with each other and ultimately share Jesus, but we're not saying that on paper. <laughs> so don't tell anybody, yeah. That is absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. I wanna ask you one last question question. We're going to start landing the plane here. Yeah. Can you tell us about the good hard life? Oh, yes. I love to talk about that. You know, I don't know about any of you, but I have struggled and wrestled so deeply with the notion of Psalm 8411, that no good thing has he withheld from those walking uprightly with him. Like, how could that be true? How is it possible that God withholds no good thing when we all know people every day, all of us likely, where good things seem to be withheld yeah. and we're walking with Jesus? What's that about? Well, I did kind of a deep dive, and I'll skip the whole story, but ended up researching a theologian from the 1600s named Sir Richard Baker. And he wrote the following, and it has just transformed my thinking that the reason that verse is true is because the good things of God, the truly good things of God, are not things at all. That the truly good things of God are nothing that this physical world could ever touch. That the good things of God are chiefly peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Spirit, the fruition of his presence in this life and the assurance of his face in the next. Of these things, we can know that God will never withhold because they're nothing the world could ever take away, nothing the world could ever touch. And when we can kind of begin to wrap our mind around that notion, of course, of course, good things and hard things can coexist. 
because the good stuff is here. It's not absent from a hard story. In fact, good and hard coexist. I believe we're all living the good, hard life where there can be joy and we get to dis disrupt the myth that there's only joy in pain-free living. You know, I love to talk about we get to celebrate in so many realms. True celebration is available even when there's sadness, even when there's process, not outcome. You know, I've attended a lot of funerals in these last 10 years of, of people from our community past. And there's this thread in some who just get it who get that there can be celebration in the process of life that's not outcome. It's a process that we get to celebrate and champion in our stories because the reality is we don't know the end of our stories. And we get to celebrate right here and right now, and I think that's the good, hard life we're all living. Amen for that. Hey, um, outside, when we dismiss, there's going to be a table out there. And um, there is a couple of books that she have. Highly recommend them. Hope Heals, a true story of overwhelming loss and overcoming love. Um, it tells the detail of the story uh, here. Another book um, called Suffering Strong. Suffering Strong. How to Survive Anything by Redefining Everything. And it'll walk you through some really good stuff. And there's some other fun things that we have. Right here, I mean, even out there, there's like, man, I should go into marketing. <laughs> Look at this. How about that for an appropriate message? Amen for that. So um, she's going to be out front and would love to talk with you all. And, and I really don't mean, forget to say the biggest thing about all of that lovely showcase of my products, I think it's really important to say that I don't get any money from this stuff. It These, goes to what? It goes to send families to camp for free. The money is not connected to Catholic love. So please buy a lot. <laughs> so if you want to be ministered to and support an incredible cause, buy a truckload of books. Yes. Thank you, okay. Mark. You yes, like that? that. Hey, That's friends, great. would you all do me a favor and thank Catherine for being with us today? Oh, thank you all so much for having me. Thank you all. What a blessing. Oh, oh go stand up. Oh, my gosh. So sweet. No, glory to God. Glory to God. Hey, let's pray. Lord, thank you uh, so much for your, your goodness. In an amazing way, um, through good moments and bad moments, through tragedy. You've given us joy because of who Jesus is. And I thank you for our sister here today that has reminded us of the joy that comes through him. Life is full of pain, but you have promised us that the best is yet to come. Thank you for using our stories for your glory. Thank you for the reminder that we've had of that today. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great day. Amen.